And so just to start out then, uh, what is Kantian philosophy? Um, I could start off if that's fine. Yeah, I think it's probably better if uh, you give the positive case because, you know, that way nobody can accuse <laughs> me of uh, <laughs> selling it. Uh, okay, uh, I, do, I do understand definitely why uh, Kantianism wouldn't ring an immediate bell with people is exactly why you described it, uh, Morgan. Um, <clears throat> be, because what we would, so Kant is like a, what we would call a s- system builder in philosophy. Uh, and system builders are what basically um, a, entire uh, worldview developers. Uh, there, there, has, there, are, there are many system builders in the history of philosophy, and Kant is just one of them, like Aristotle, Plato, uh, Descartes, Spinoza, etc. Uh, um, so Kant, when you say Kantian, it would probably matter what context you're using Kantianism in. Uh, but his main, most important contributions have been in metaphysics and uh, ethics. Uh, it's metaphysics in with his work of critique of pure reason, uh, and in ethics he has two major, like three, ma- many, bo- two, three. Uh, contributions, but I, I think like two major ones, critique of practical reason and groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Um, uh, but generally, the concepts such as the ontology is his uh, uh, introduction. Um, uh, to just break it down, uh, Kant is an Enlightenment thinker who developed this understanding of um, um, uh, in in the in a metaphysical sense, there is a what he would call a noumenal world and a phenomenal world, where he distinguishes because um um uh, what, what what he differentiates as what we perceive and what really is things in of themselves, as he describes it. And there are t- four major concepts that uh, go in like have relations to each other, such as analytic, synthetic, and a priori, a posteriori sort of four major uh, claims about it. Um, uh, when it comes to analytic, uh, synthetic divide, what the this differentiation between those two concepts would be um, analytics statements are statements that uh, deepens our understanding of a concept where the predicate is uh, su- uh, within the subject of the statement. And synthetic statements are what broadens our understanding of anything, uh, which would be um, like going deeper in an ocean or going f- further in an ocean kind of understanding uh, uh, of increasing our knowledge. Uh, with, with a priori and a posteriori, it would, uh, what we would describe is whether or not we have a... Uh, how would we justify the statement that is given? Uh, if, it's, if, if I say the claim uh, that it is raining... Uh, that would be an, a posteriori claim because what we would have to do is go outside and see that it is raining to justify the uh, claim. Uh, uh, so it would be like an empirical claim and a sense data driven claim. But if I said all bachelors are unmarried, that would not be a. Uh, a I wouldn't have to go to every bachelor to confirm that they are in fact unmarried. Uh, so that that would be the main distinction. Um, th- these seem really similar uh, because most most of the time, what we would say is there are analytic. Most analytic claims are a priori, while most uh, synthetic claims are a posteriori. What is major in Kant's work is he says there is a mini uh, small uh, set of things that are synthetic a priori statements. Uh, which would be things that broadens our understanding of the world, but do not require us to go outside and test these things, uh, examine them exactly in a scientific sense, to be able to for us to understand. That's his m- one of his major metaphysical contributions. Um, uh, do you? Uh, uh, so before we go into any type of ethical things, is it Kuzulu? You want to say anything about that? All of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. So. Um... I suppose um, I think that's a decent enough uh, description of the metaphysics, but I kind of want to frame this as to why you know you know this kind of sounds esoteric at the moment, 
Like uh, mm-hmm. I want to frame it as like, why is this so important in philosophy? Why do people care about this? So, mm-hmm. so like basically like, um, in the history of philosophy, you have like, you know, uh, from like Greece up to, until the 18th century, you have like basically two different types of people. Uh, there were those philosophers who declared that reason could know reality and those who declared it couldn't. Of the those who declared it couldn't, there are like the explicit mystics, like, you know, the Christian medievals, where it's like, reason is completely useless, it doesn't matter because God just controls everything, so you can't ever know anything about anything. So you just have to have these mystic trances, these sorts of ineffable feelings, and that's how you contact reality. You know, and, you know, this actually goes back before the Christians. And then there's the skeptics, like David Hume, who say, um, you can't know, reason can't know reality, um, and there isn't some mystic means to know it. It's just, I don't know how on earth you can uh, get to know reality. Um, so, like, this is the, the core question of this day. How can we um, get to know reality? How can we get to have any sort of metaphysics? Because on, when we get to the point of Hume, it's like in question whether or not metaphysics is even a thing anymore. And, you know, this is... Um, uh, Hume, des- uh, sorry, Kant describes this as being woken from his dogmatic trance, or dogmatic slumber, sorry, uh, mm. when he, like, read Hume. It was like, wow, okay, right, because he was in the school of the um, dogmatic rationalists, like, you know, people like uh, Spinoza uh, and Leibniz yeah. and uh, Descartes. So, like, they, they had these, like, systems where it's like, okay, I'm going to do you know, all this rationalistic deductions, and I think that there are these sorts of innate content, and we can build up metaphysics from this point. Um, but Kant was like, well, I mean, none of these people are actually... None of them answer Hume um, to my satisfaction, you know, none of them are too satisfaction, right? None of them can properly answer Hume. So then, like, Kant comes in and, like, you know, the Copernican revolution, he comes in with a completely uh, different approach. It is not that reality out there is imposing laws onto us. It's that uh, we are imposing laws onto whatever is coming in from reality, whatever is coming in from, you know, coming in. I suppose we'll get into that later, uh, from the noumenal world. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not we know what things are in themselves, because we can still be rational, we can still be reasonable within the phenomenal world, within the world of our perceptions, how we perceive things. And basically his whole system is trying to show that, well, the way we perceive things in our noumenal world, there are certain ineffable laws. We, If anybody could ever talk to me, or, you know, if they can just hear like the three knocks, right? then they have to have certain categories of understanding. They have to agree on certain things because uh, they their brains have to be processing the completely unknowable noumenal world in some sort of way. And I suppose that's like, uh, I don't want to get into like a, you know, too much of a objectivism critique, critique of him yet. Uh, that's just, <laughs> I, I think that shows why he's like important in philosophy. He like basically entrenches this entirely new view. This like, you don't have modern subjectivism without Kant. Basically. Okay. 